trust in you, Jesus. You're all, you're all, you're all that we need. Your power will pull us through. We're trusting in you. We're trusting in you. You give us hope and life that's forever. You make us bold and we stand together. This journey, there's no looking back. With Jesus to lead us, we're on the right track. Oh, 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 oh. Wide open spaces for wide open eyes. We're looking ahead for the next big surprise. Oh, oh, oh. For more than a hundred years, Guidestone has been on a mission to provide dignity to retirement-aged Southern Baptist ministers, workers, and widows in need. It was the heart of our founder, William Lunsford, as he observed veteran pastors and their widows in poverty to provide for these soldiers of the cross in their declining years. Give yourself wholeheartedly to the work. We'll stand back of you. If you fall in the work, we'll care for you. If you die, we will not allow your family to suffer. If you grow old in the work, we'll comfort you in your declining years. Throughout the past century, donations from people like you and churches like yours have met the needs of Mission Dignity recipients. These heroes of the faith have served steadfastly during their ministry years, shepherding churches, caring for others, and sharing the gospel. And I always wanted to have that as an epitaph for my tombstone. Passing through, he preached the word. From one generation to the next, Mission Dignity has served devoted pastors who were paid very little and were barely able to afford their monthly bills. And I have went to bed hungry because I want my bills paid. I've got to pay for my medicine. In recent decades, many pastors served and still serve churches at the crossroads of small towns, inner cities, and remote places receiving very little income. I didn't have a mega church, but I had a mega heart. Additionally, 
This past year has been especially difficult for recipients who found themselves sheltering in place in the pandemic. Isolated, lonely, and afraid to get out among people, even to go to church. As it is written in 1 Timothy, these laborers are worthy of double honor. The wonderful thing about giving to Mission Dignity is that 100% of your donations go to the recipient. The Lord uses it in a great and mighty way. Your gifts make a tremendous difference in the lives of God's choicest servants, and Mission Dignity serves them by providing financial support, sending care packages, making wellness calls, and meeting emergency needs such as medical, dental, and home repairs. I want to thank all of you who are helping us. Mission Dignity is essential for our survival in a better way. God bless you and God bless the ministry of the Mission Dignity. Give honor. Give dignity. Give today. Text MD Sunday to 41444 or visit missiondignity.org. Good morning, everyone. Pastor Mark Hensley from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church here in Colorado Springs, and we have transplanted the church into a forest here in the Rocky Mountain Railway, VBS, that concludes tomorrow. And so I'm in the midst of trees and elk and cougars and all kinds of things. But we've had a good week this week with the kids and grateful for the props that were a gift from the uh, Heart of the Springs Baptist Church here in Colorado Springs. And some of their youth and adults have come over and helped us this week. So we've had a good week. And our own folks, of course, have been a part of this week. But we're glad you're watching today and honored to have you. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for Vacation Bible School, for children hearing the good news of Jesus Christ, and we pray that you draw them to yourself and that you would continue to move in the life of this church and in the churches of those who are watching, and thank you for their being our guest today. We are grateful for all that we are because of all that you've done, and ask that you guide our time. In Jesus' name, amen. So be sure to uh, share this with your friends. Let us know if we can pray for you in any way. I want to show you a picture of modern day Thessalonica. It is a big city. In fact, its population exceeds a million people. It's on the Aegean Sea, on the coast of the Aegean Sea. And it has, uh, it's, the Aegean Sea, by the way, it's 420 miles long, 240 miles wide. And Thessalonica, 2,000 years ago, was the home of a church that meant a great deal to the Apostle Paul. And he is thinking about them as we continue a series today about the crowns that a believer can earn in service to the Lord. Today's crown is the soul winner's crown. And what's interesting about today is you will feel the pathos, the heartbeat of the Apostle Paul. And I can identify as a pastor for nearly 33 years, the people that line the highway of my life are like mile markers, and I think of how impactful they've been to me in every church I've ever served. And you become uh, close to God's people. You feel their warmth, their affection, and their friendship. And we long to be with them. And when you get right down to the text we're going to look at today, you realize that relationships matter most. We're going to talk about that today. In fact, what Paul will say to them is, you are my crown. You are my hope. Now, his hope, first of all, foremost, was in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he knew the value of sharing the great joy of knowing the Lord with others and seeing them come to know the Lord and realizing that not only did they become his, not only did they become heirs and join heirs with God in Christ, but they become forever friends. And so this message today is very personal, written from a pastor. Some believe it is the oldest book that Paul wrote and it uh, is a book just filled with drama and intrigue and a real enemy that is our enemy to this day. And there's so much packed into this passage of Scripture that I'm excited to share, 
share it with you. And, and you know, Paul's looking forward as we are to the return of Jesus. And Paul is asking the Thessalonians, it's a rhetorical question, what is the hope? <clears throat> what would give me the greatest joy? It's your salvation. It's you coming to know him. It's you living your life for him. And his answer to his own question is profound. Those who have shared in the gospel of Jesus Christ are my greatest joy. So today we're continuing the series on the five crowns that a believer can earn. Today it is the crown of rejoicing found in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 17 through 19. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 17. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again. But Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord at his coming? Is it not you? For you are glory, our glory and our joy. The crown of rejoicing is a poignant reminder on this weekend in June that friends will leave. No matter how good a friendship is, it always has its time. And not only will friends leave, we will face and have, since the moment of our conversion, a real enemy. Described as the sinister minister of discouragement. He is that and much more. And then you'll notice today, the crowd of rejoicing reminds us friends will leave. It reminds us we have a real enemy who wants to hinder our progress in the things of God. And we can anticipate joyful relationships. So notice, first of all, in the text, friends will leave. Here is Paul writing to this church in Thessalonica. He's thinking about them. You see, he had to abruptly leave them because of a riot that took place in Thessalonica. And they had to scurry him away by nightfall because he was in danger of losing his own life. And friends had made his escape possible. And now he finds himself in Corinth. Corinth was over 300 miles from Thessalonica, and the distance seems minute to us today with modern travel, but it might as well have been a thousand miles. And he feels that, that longing, that yearning to be back with his friends. You ever felt homesick? You ever felt the weighty loss of a dear friend? Maybe literally they've departed to be with Christ. Or maybe experiences in life and transitions have taken them across the country. Do you realize the average person moves every six years? We're just all transients. We're kind of just passing through. What a very real way Paul has passed through their lives. He abruptly is torn from them. And the phrase he uses is very intriguing to me. But since we were torn away from you, being torn away is a word in the text that's used in a more general sense to describe the loss of any friend or relative. It means to cause someone to be separated with the implication of emotional deprivation. The idea is the separation and deprivation of, of someone close and intimate to you, like a parent always walking with you, constantly then there with you, vigilant and compassionate, and all of a sudden, in a moment, that influence is gone. That's the essence of the word. I want you to feel the weight of it. We were torn away from you. And it was in a violent manner. It's in Acts chapter 17 where the riot in Thessalonica takes place. Remember, Thessalonica is a Greek port city on the Aegean Sea. Paul is hurried out of that town to Berea. It's about 45 miles away in northern Greece. That's where he initially goes to uh, right after the riot. But now he has traveled down to Corinth, 300 plus miles away. All of us, if you live long enough, have experienced unwelcome goodbyes. People come and go in and out of our lives. And it's 
frustrating. Have you ever noticed the people you'd like to stay in your life seem to be the ones that leave and the people that you wouldn't mind moving on <laughs> never do? <laughs> I don't know why that is. But it's just the nature of relationships, I suppose. But remember to cherish friendship because it is a true gift of God. But remember, friends come and go. They're often in our lives for only a season. A writer said, I dropped a tear in the ocean. The day you find it is the day I will stop missing you. I uh, think of many people that fit that bill for me. He says, but since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, he said, in person, not in the heart. I love that phrase. He's saying, we're still connected. We're still vitally connected. It's just we can't be with each other in person. But our hearts are beating for one another. He said, we endeavor the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face. I know what it's like to have to be away from family. I've been that way my whole life. And then God's providence, nearly three years ago now, he let Laura and I come back to our hometown to be near our, with our sons and uh, with uh, their spouses are not so far away. Two of our sons are married. And then with my mom and my brother and his family. And it's just amazing to be able to reconnect because when we left Colorado Springs, after we got married in August of 1981, it was seven years of school in Texas, and then literally 30 years nearly of ministry everywhere else but here. But God takes care of the here and the now, and he allows us sometimes to rekindle relationships. I think it's so important to value every friend that you have. You know, when I was a young pastor, someone said this to me one time, if you have five true friends in your lifetime, Mark, you'll be very fortunate. And when I first heard that, I thought, well, I'll have many friends. I mean, I try to be friendly. The Bible says if a man or woman will have friends, they must show themselves to be friendly. But I look back now on that sage advice and it was right on the mark then. It's right on the mark now. A lot of us have a lot of acquaintances, but real friends, and someone to find friendship is someone who rushes in when the rest of the world rushes out. <laughs> Herma Bombeck said, a real friend is someone who doesn't go on a diet when you're fat. <laughs> so I guess that's a great way to describe friendship. But I just thank God for real friends. But I realize that life changes, situations change, job opportunities come in to uh, focus and people go on. Farewells, folks, listen, are inevitable. But in Christ, we never say goodbye for the final time because a remarkable reunion is assured. But listen, each step of the journey, realize you have a very real enemy who wants to hinder and limit your spiritual growth, your vitality, and your service to our glorious King. He wants you to doubt that glorious reunion some bright someday. He wants you to doubt that you ever experience. He wants you it. He wants you to think you're always going to be in the situation you're in, and that there's no way out. And of course, we know that's a lie, but no mistake about it. We've got a real enemy. Do you see it in the text? Because we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, wanted to come to you again and again. But do you see it? Satan hindered us. In this verse, Paul lays the blame on his inability to get back to Thessalonica in a timely fashion on old Slewfoot himself, Satan. Every time he tried to visit the Thessalonican brothers and sisters, circumstances popped up to keep him from going back, and he attributes that interference to the work of the devil. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, the Apostle Paul gives us a class in spiritual warfare. Verses 11 and 12. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the authorities, against the rulers, against the cosmic powers of the darkness, evil spiritual forces in the heavens. Paul speaks of Satan as a powerful 
adversary. Clearly because God was working in Paul's life and his ministry, Satan did not want him to go back to that seaport city on the coast of the Aegean Sea, Thessalonica. He wanted to keep him from being influential in the kingdom of God. Paul was someone he wanted to destroy. And make no mistake about it, he wants to take you out too. He wants to take me out too. Why is it that so many Christians fizzle at the finish? Probably because their beginning maybe wasn't anchored deep enough into the soil of Christ. Dr. Rogers used to call people who didn't finish the Christian life out Alka-Seltzer Christians. You just put them in water, they pop, pop, fizz, fizz, and they disappear. Well, don't let that be your story. Don't let that be your narrative. Finish strong. Be steadfast, unmovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you, much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. But Satan will try to trip you up. He'll throw uh, temptation in front of you. He'll try to lure you into a less devoted surrender of your life to Christ. He'll try to convince you you don't need to volunteer, you don't need to give, you've already done that, time to take your ease and Zion. Listen, it's not time for us to sit in a rocking chair and reminisce. In fact, I like Caleb in the Old Testament, don't you? Caleb and Joshua were two of the ten spies that came back from the promised land who didn't have a grasshopper complex. <laughs> the other eight said, well, we, we, we can't overcome these people, they're like giants in our eyes. And Caleb, that 85-year-old warrior, said, well, I don't know about the rest of you, but if God said we can do it, we can do it. And the Bible says in the Old Testament that Caleb had a spirit, a different spirit. You know what it was? It was the anointing of the Holy Spirit that said there is more ground to conquer. Don't cave in and don't give up. Keep on moving forward. But Satan wants to throw it. Satan wants to deceive. Satan wants to keep you from soaring spiritually. Paul was committed to fight against that roadblock any way he could. If he couldn't be there in person, he decided to write to the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians. Isn't that something? Now, as I said earlier, some scholars believe that's the oldest book from an apostle to a church. Here's the, here's the rub. Satan wanted to hinder him. Every time I'm going to go to Thessalonica, I can't get there. So I think I'll just write a letter to them. Never knowing that the Holy Spirit of God would breathe on his pen as he wrote scripture, sacred scripture, and God would take the word of God and saturate the world with it. It is still the world's bestseller, and you have right now, laying across your lap, the book of 1 Thessalonians, because what Paul uh, wanted to do was hindered by Satan. So what God wanted to do was spread the message even wider. Reminds me of Genesis 50 <clears throat> when uh, Joseph has reached the second position of command in all of Egypt. His brothers had sold him into slavery 13 years earlier <clears throat> to Ishmaelite uh, slave traders in Dothan. And he had risen through the ranks, becomes a high-ranking Egyptian official. And he says to his brothers, really... What is so apropos to the text today in 1 Thessalonians, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. God can take what seems to be a dead end and give you a detour to a better place. So don't, don't be in despair. Just realize God's at work and he's got a plan and maybe you don't see it coming into focus. Let him dial it in. Like when you go to see the eye doctor and he goes, okay, there's going to be this uh, hot air balloon out there and it's all blurry. And he goes, how about this? Well, I can see it now. And, and they're, they're manipulating those little, those little uh, ocular things in the, in the office. God is saying, don't try to finish uh, out the future until you get there in your mind. Let God fill in the details of your life. <clears throat> when Satan saw the great work God did through these letters, I bet you he regretted ever trying to keep Paul from getting to Thessalonica. Don't you think he'd rather just let that lone apostle uh, stroll back up yonder, even if it took him a, a few months to get there, than to let this letter become explosive and cover the whole earth? I do. And you say, well, what happened? Did he ever get to go back? He did. Just read Acts chapter 20, 1 through 5. 
<clears throat> the Apostle Paul describes the eventual return to Thessalonica and to other churches in the area. So sometimes God's allowed delays and denials are only for a season. He will get you to where he wants you to go when he wants you to get there. Remember that. <clears throat> so remember, friends will leave. We have a real enemy. And thankfully, because of what the Lord Jesus has done for us, do you notice we have joyful relationships now? <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> and wonderful relationships to look forward to. And he says to them, for what? Is our hope or joy or crown or boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? For you, meaning you people in Thessalonica that are on my heart, as I sit here wishing to be with you, as I write this book of 1 Thessalonians, you are our glory and joy. You know, commenting on 1 Thessalonians, Dallas pastor Tony Evans writes about three anchors that you and I need in tough times. Number one, the anchor of God's word. God's scripture within us sustains us. He went on to say, if you don't have anything cooking on the inside, no wonder you'll be surprised when you fall. You won't be surprised when you fall apart on the outside. So meditate on the word of God. Have an in-bibbing of God's word. Study to show thyself approved, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you're going to make it through tough, perilous times, have the anchor of God's word in your life. Number two, the second anchor is fellowship with other believers. God created churches so that you and I won't be alone. We're part of a body. We are part of a family. And remember, a family is more important than anything. Blood is thicker than water, but I tell you what I've experienced in these 33 years nearly of being a pastor, the fellowship with God's people is richer than fellowship with my own relatives who don't know Jesus. To be with God's people, to feel their heartbeat, to know their passion, to walk with them through the challenges of life is a great privilege as a pastor. And then to know those relationships never end. It thrills me to no end. I'm thinking now of a man I was his pastor many years ago in my first church, Brother J.C. Sims. Love J.C. Sims. Had a gregarious, welcoming, joyful personality. He and Betty were very faithful to the church in Rocky Ford, but he never joined. And I asked him one time, I said, J.C., why won't you join the church? He said, Pastor, because I've seen so many people join the church and they never come back. I said, well, why don't you be the difference maker? I can still see him on a work day over 30 years ago. He's on the outside of the church with Windex and he's looking at me just cleaning a window for the glory of God. I love J.C. Sims and his wife, Betty, and I'm going to see them Again, in every stop along the journey of my own life, I've met the sainted friends of God who love Jesus, whose eyes shone with the inner anointed brilliance of his presence. I've seen their tenderness and their care for Laura and I and our sons. And yes, I've met people that weren't nice, weren't kind, but I don't think they're in the fold. A, a true believer lives out the truth of the scripture and Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit. But I have been much more blessed than hurt in my journey. And if I could do it all over again, I'd still be a pastor because it's been a joy. <clears throat> Tony Evans is saying, if you're going to make it through tough times, as he's commenting on 1 Thessalonians, he said, you better be anchored in God's word. You better be anchored to a church that preaches the whole counsel of God cares about the community and doesn't just sit behind the four walls and shakes and shivers at the headlines on the, on the uh, constant stream on, on YouTube or on Yahoo. We need churches that believe that we're supposed to take the gospel and let people know that we're here to help them. The third anchor is what we're really talking about today. As you're navigating through tough times, you and I need a vision of God. A vision that captivates, a vision that compels us to believe God for more. For what is our hope? What is our joy or our crown 
of boasting before our Lord Jesus as it, at his coming. Is it not you? For you are our glory and our joy in light of the Lord Jesus' return. Paul's greatest joy was leading others to the Lord Jesus Christ. He had a kingdom perspective. He had an eternal perspective. It's about reaching others. Paul assures the Thessalonians that he, should never, he will never forget them because they were his glory and his joy. He's just thinking about them. They fill his mind. They fill his heart. And the Thessalonian Christians reminded him that in Christ there are no more goodbyes, just an eternal reunion that waits. Corey Ten Boom said, When I enter that beautiful city and the saints all around me appear, I hope that someone will tell me it was you who invited me here. Do you want to win this crown? Then you give your life to serving Jesus Christ. And when he brings people into the stream of your own life, into the relationship that he puts around you with others, tell them what he's done for you. Let, let people know. Let me tell you about my friend who changed my life. I think often of the future and that reunion I look so forward to. I know you do too. And I'm reminded today of a song by Sandy Patty and Wayne Watson. It was called Another Time in Another Place. Listen to the lyrics. I've always heard that there is a land beyond the mortal dreams of man. With every tear will be left behind, but it must be in another time. Every tear will be left behind, but it must be in another time. There'll be an everlasting light shining in purest holy white, and every fear will be erased, but it must be in another place. So I'm waiting for another time in another place where all my hopes and dreams will be captured with one look at Jesus' face. Oh, my heart's been burning and my soul keeps yearning. Sometimes I can hardly wait for that sweet, sweet someday when I'll be swept away to another time in another place. I've grown so tired of earthly things. They promise peace but furnish pain. All of life's sweetest joys combined can never match those of another time. And though I've put my trust in Christ and felt his spirit move in my life, I know it's truly just a taste of his glory in another place. That's what Paul felt. That's what Paul writes about. And if you and I are to earn the soul winner's crown, we have to be more concerned about the salvation of others than the possible rejection of our testimony. Just tell them what he's done for you. You remember, folks, successful witnessing is telling what Jesus has done for you and the power of the Holy Spirit and leaving the results up to God. The crown of rejoicing. Remember, friends will leave. They come and they go, but he, no, he won't leave you. We have a real enemy, but thankfully, because of Christ, we have victory. We serve from a position of victory. And then finally, joyful relationships await. That's a lot to be thankful for. I long for those reunions. I do. Thankfully for Facebook, you at least get to keep up with people. But that's a poor substitute for what we'll experience one day. Remember this. Is there anything worse than being lost? Yes, it's being lost and not having anyone look for you. And I pray that God will put someone on your heart this week. Send them a note. Call them. Maybe send them a Bible. Let them know I'm praying for you and I want you to know my King. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for everyone watching. I pray that we would remember that relationships why they seem to be so transitory in you are solid and significant and never end. Remind us that we have a real enemy and help us to dive deep into the word for protection and run to you when we're afraid. And then Lord, remind us that there is that great reunion waiting and we need to have that end fixed in our mind because you have appointed a time when at last we will be with you in another time in another place. Bless the hearing of your word for anyone here who's not saved. <clears throat> I pray that they would verbally ask you to come into their life, 
forgive you, forgive them of your, uh, that they would ask you to forgive them of their sins, be forgiven, be placed in the kingdom of God, their name written in the Lamb's book of life, and they would give you their hearts. Thank you for their lives. And bless the word of God continually as we serve you this coming week. <clears throat> in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pastor Mark Hensley from the Pikes Peak Park Baptist Church in the middle of the forest saying, I hope you have a great rest of your Sunday afternoon. Bye, folks. <laughs>